Sup, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, one of the most misunderstood drugs in the Hair Cafe cinematic universe is minoxidil. We all know that minoxidil works to stop hair loss. That's no secret. It is, after all, the very first drug that was FDA approved for the treatment of hair loss. But despite all that, it seems like nobody can agree on how minoxidil works exactly. So, let's clear up some misunderstandings about minoxidil. The most common misunderstanding by far is that Minoxidil works by increasing blood flow. This is, of course, completely wrong, but I can still understand why some people think this. After all, minoxidil was originally developed as a drug to treat high blood pressure. Minoxidil is a vasodilator, which means it expands blood vessels, so minoxidil actually does increase blood flow. However, that is not the reason why minoxidil works to stimulate hair growth. It turns out that almost all blood pressure medications increase blood flow. That includes calcium channel blockers like doltiazem, alpha blockers like doxazosin, ACE inhibitors like lucinopril, and direct vasodilators like hydralazine. But despite the fact that all these classes of drugs increase blood flow, guess what none of them do? That's right, none of them actually cause hair growth, only minoxidil does. So how is it possible that we have all these drugs that increase blood flow, yet minoxidil is the only one that actually works to promote hair growth? Well, there is a simple answer to that one, Shooms. It's because decreased blood flow is not what causes hair loss. And believe me, I have a lot to say about that topic. Far more than I could possibly explain in just one simple video. Fortunately, though, I have an entire playlist on why blood flow has nothing to do with hair loss and why products and programs that market themselves as being effective at stopping hair loss by improving blood circulation of the scalp are all universally scamful. So please, make sure you check out that list if you're not convinced yet. But getting back on subject, how is it that minoxidil works? I mean, we know it works, that's without question, but since blood flow has nothing to do with hair loss, then minoxidil's mechanism of action has got to be something besides its effects on blood flow. So what is it then, and how does minoxidil actually work? Well. Interestingly enough, some people think that it might be because minoxidil is an anti-androgen. Some people in my comment section recently mentioned this article here that claims that minoxidil works as an anti-androgen. That would be especially interesting because if that were true, that would mean that minoxidil would work similarly to most hair loss drugs that work by lowering DHT levels on the scalp, like finasteride and dutasteride. But as interesting as this theory may be, it is actually a false theory. It is a better explanation than the blood flow theory, I'll admit but it is still wrong and I'll explain why. So let me go over the article in question and then I'll tell you why I don't think this is really how minoxidil works. Afterwards, I'll go ahead and show you another paper that shows that minoxidil works by a completely different mechanism that doesn't involve androgens or blood flow. So this paper is from our research team in China. This study is divided into two parts. The first part is very theoretical. It was done totally on computers and utilized a new technique called network pharmacology. Network pharmacology, it uses databases and artificial intelligence to predict what effects drugs will have on different proteins. It looks at the 3D structure of the drugs and sees how it fits into the 3D structure of many different kinds of proteins in order to see which proteins could be affected by the drug. It is a technique to rapidly develop new drugs without having to do a lot of testing in vitro or in vivo. So, in other words, it sounds like something that would come out of China. So, using this technique, the investigators found that minoxidil can possibly react with hundreds of proteins in the protein database. They then cross-referenced this result with a database of over 400 genes that have been associated with androgenic alopecia. From this, they were able to identify the most likely proteins that are associated with androgenic alopecia that minoxidil interacts with. They then looked more closely at the way minoxidil could dock with these proteins in three dimensions. For example, here is an image of minoxidil docking with the androgen receptor protein. After all this computer processing, the investigators concluded that the three most likely protein targets of minoxidil were the androgen receptor and two enzymes called CYP17A1 and CYP17A1. CYP19A1. CYP17A1 is an enzyme that is involved in the synthesis of testosterone. CYP19A1 is the aromatase enzyme. Now I've got to be honest here, Chooms. I don't know whether this computer analysis is legitimate or if it is all just complete bullshit. 
shit. I mean, I've seen less complicated research on how to fabricate wormholes and stabilize them in order to facilitate faster than light interstellar travel. Fortunately though, the investigators did some actual experiments with living tissue too, instead of just trolling on their computers all day. What the investigators looked at in these experiments was how minoxidil affected the gene expression of the androgen receptor and of CYP17A1 and CYP19A1 in some cultured human dermal papilla cells. The investigators found that minoxidil decreased the gene expression and synthesis of the androgen receptor. Minoxidil also decreased the gene expression of CYP17A1, but minoxidil increased the gene expression of CYP19A1, though for some reason the synthesis of the CYP19A1 protein was not increased. Finally, the investigators found that in the dermal papilla cells treated with minoxidil, estradiol levels increase and DHT levels decrease. CYP19A1 activity increase, which like I said before, is another name for the aromatase enzyme. So the investigators concluded from these computers and in vitro studies that minoxidil might alter some hormonal pathways in the cells and end up affecting DHT and estrogen levels as well as decreasing androgen receptors. Those effects would theoretically benefit hair growth in people with androgen alopecia. Specifically, minoxidil lowered CYP17A1, which is involved in synthesizing testosterone and in synthesizing DHT from testosterone, as well as from the so-called backdoor pathway, which I talked about a few times. In addition, minoxidil increased CYP19A1 enzyme activity, which is the aromatase enzyme, and so it increased estrogen levels. Finally, minoxidil decreased the expression of the androgen receptor. So, this is all really interesting and complicated, of course, but it actually is not the first time someone has proposed the notion that minoxidil has an effect on androgens. In fact, since the mechanism of minoxidil is still unknown, there have been many different theories about how it works exactly. As you can see from this review article on minoxidil, there have been many proposals about the mechanism of minoxidil. These mechanisms include its vasodilator effects, also known as the Blutfu theory, which we have already debunked many times and nobody takes seriously anymore, but there are some other proposed mechanisms which include anti-inflammatory effects, effects on the WNT wind pathway and possibly anti-androgen effects like in this article we just saw. However, there are many things that contradict the anti-androgen theory of minoxidil. First of all, there are studies that go against the anti-androgen theory. For example, even though the study we just went over showed that minoxidil could theoretically decrease testosterone and DHT levels in cultured dermal papilla cells, this study here shows the opposite effect. In this study, like in the other study, minoxidil was given to cultured human dermal papilla cells this time from areas of balding and non-balding scalp. In dermal papilla cells from the balding scalp, minoxidil increased the enzyme 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, which is an enzyme involved in testosterone synthesis, and it even increased the 5-air enzyme somewhat. Both those effects would actually increase DHD in the hair follicles, not decrease it like was seen in the previous study. There are also some animal studies that suggest that minoxidil has no androgenic effect. I won't go over them here because they're not as valuable as human data obviously, but I'll put them in the description below if you're interested in reading them anyways. However, even putting science aside for a moment and just using pure intuition, there are some logical, common sense reasons that explain why minoxidil can have any significant anti-androgenic activity. For example, we know that minoxidil works in other hair loss conditions that aren't related to androgens, like telogen effluvium or alopecia areata. Drugs that lower DHT like finasteride and dutasteride don't treat these conditions at all, and that's because they are not due to an excess of DHT on the scalp. So minoxidil shouldn't work either either if its mechanism of actions was related to something like lowering DHT. An anti-androgenic effect wouldn't explain why minoxidil works for non-androgenic causes of hair loss. Also, minoxidil causes increased hair growth even in people with normal hair. It even stimulates body hair and beard hair growth, both of which are stimulated by androgens paradoxically enough, including DHT. If minoxidil were an anti-androgen, it would decrease body hair and beard growth, but it doesn't. It promotes hair growth in both of those regions of the body. The truth is, is that there is a much better explanation for minoxidil's hair growth stimulating effects that is much more likely than its effects on androgens, inflammation, the wind pathway, or blood flow. The reason why minoxidil works is because it has a direct effect on a specific potassium channel that is present in the hair follicles. The theory is explained very well in this paper here. So, you guys may remember earlier that I mentioned that minoxidil is unique amongst blood pressure medications and that it causes hair growth. Well, to be honest, 
that isn't completely true because there are two other obscure and rarely used blood pressure medications that cause hair growth besides minoxidil. They are diazoxide and panacetyl. All three drugs work by opening a specific potassium channel called the KATP channel. Opening this channel is actually what causes the vasodilator effects of all three of these medications. So I know what some of you are thinking right now, but Kevin, if opening the KATP channel causes vasodilation, then doesn't that prove that the Brifro theory is actually true? Well, the investigators asked themselves that question too. If these drugs cause hair growth because the effect on the potassium channel causes vasodilation, does that prove that the brute flu theory is actually true? Or is it possible that this effect on the potassium channel directly increases hair growth completely independent of the brute flu theory? Well, the investigators point out that while 5% topical minoxidil increases brute flu in the scalp, 3% minoxidil doesn't. But even 2% minoxidil is still effective in causing hair growth. In fact, when the drug was first approved back in the 1980s, that was the only concentration of topical minoxidil that was actually available. So when minoxidil is applied at a low enough dose, it doesn't actually influence blood flu at all, but despite that, it still works. So this is yet another reason why minoxidil's blood flu effect is not the cause of its effects on hair growth. But most importantly, like I pointed out at the very beginning of this video, quote, not all vasodilators stimulate hair growth, so follicular responses seem more probable." Unquote. So, to resolve this, the investigators did experiments with cultured human hair follicles. Keep in mind that cultured human hair follicles have no blood supply at all, so blood flow obviously has no effect at all in this particular environment. What the investigators showed us is that the specific potassium channel that minoxidil opens, which is called the SUR2 channel, is present in the bulb of the human hair follicle. Since hair follicles have this potassium channel, that means that they can be directly influenced by a drug like minoxidil that opens up the channel. Next, the investigator showed that minoxidil prolonged the amount of time the cultured hair follicles spent in the antigen growth phase of the hair cycle. You can see that in this figure here where the green squares show the highest concentration of minoxidil. Finally, the researchers gave a drug called tolbutamide. Tolbutamide actually closes down the potassium channel that minoxidil opens, so you can kind of think of tolbutamide as being a reverse minoxidil. Giving tolbutamide shortened the antigen growth phase of the hair follicles and minoxidil Minoxidil reversed that effect, as you can see in this figure here, where the red triangles are tolbutamide. As the investigators say, these results are very exciting. Clearly, the potassium channel plays a role in triggering the antigen growth phase of the hair cycle. The investigators propose that, quote, potassium ATP channels may play a role in regulating transfer of messages between the dermal papilla and matrix, unquote. So this is all pretty complicated research we're talking about here, Chum, so let me summarize what I've gone over so far. I'm skeptical that minoxidil has any antiandrogenic effect for the reasons I already gave. If it does have any antiandrogenic effects, they must be very minor, far too minor to influence hair growth one way or the other, especially given the fact that minoxidil is a general growth stimulant that works in all forms of hair loss, not just androgenic alopecia, and it even promotes hair growth in regions of the body where androgens are beneficial, like facial and body hair. Even if minoxidil causes a very small decrease in DHT levels in the hair follicles, you need more than a small amount of DHT suppression if you're going to treat androgenic alopecia. There are plenty of natural substances out there, like mushrooms, green tea, sal palmetto, nettle root, etc., etc., that have a small amount of 5-air blocking effect, but they don't do anything for hair loss because they are far, far too weak. Secondly, out of all the theories, I think the effect on the potassium channel is the most likely one on how minoxidil works, since that is a mechanism that has been well validated experimentally. Finally, for the millionth time, hair growth from minoxidil has nothing to do with blood flow. The only reason why people like to say minoxidil works by improving blood flow to the the scalp is because they're fucking scammers who are trying to convince you that you can stop hair loss with scalp massages or with overpriced blood pressure cuffs that have been modified to fit the head. But I hope this information is helpful to you chooms in better understanding how minoxidil works. Like I said before, we don't have absolute proof on how it works, but it is clear that minoxidil's mechanism of action has nothing to do with DHT. And since DHT is the hormone that accelerates
tolerates antigenic alopecia, anyone who wants to stop hair loss cannot rely on minoxidil alone for the long term. Out of all the theories that have ever been proposed though, the potassium channel theory is the best one we have by far. But no matter how minoxidil works, what is most important of all is that it does work. And anyone who wants to get more hair growth than what they're getting from finasteride or dutasteride alone should definitely add minoxidil because it is still the best hair growth stimulant on the market by far. Okay, that should do it for today. Thank you so much for watching Hair Loss Witchers. I'll see you all next time. God bless.